Welcome to the latest International Institute for Strategic Studies webinar. My name is Adam Wood. I'm Director of Studies here at the ISS and I will be chairing this event, which is entitled Nuclear Proliferation Success and Failure, Iran and North Korea. An issue is whether the Iran nuclear accord holds any lessons for dealing with North Korea. Exactly one year after it was signed on the 14th of July 2015, Iran and the major powers are sticking to the letter of the deal, but there are charges on both sides that it isn't being honored in spirit. Iran is complaining that it remains largely cut off from the global financial system, and its adversaries worry about the unabated pace of Iran's missile development program. North Korea is also continuing its missile advances, and in its case without any kind of limitation on its nuclear program. The kind of sanctions that helped to bring Iran to the negotiating table are now being applied to North Korea, but Kim Jong-un, the North Korean leader, doesn't show any sign of willingness to compromise in the manner that was key to achieving the Iran deal. These issues are going to be assessed for us by Mark Fitzpatrick, who is Executive Director of IISS Americas, based in Washington, D.C., and at the same time head of the Non-Proliferation and Nuclear Policy Program of the Institute. He is an internationally recognized expert on the cases of Iran and North Korea, as well as a range of other non-proliferation issues. And he joined the ISS in October of 2005, having spent a 26-year career at the U.S. Department of State, including as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Non-Proliferation. Following his presentation of about 20 to 25 minutes, we're going to open up the floor to your questions. You should feel free to send your questions in either beginning straight away or at any point during the presentation, and you can do that through the chat function. The questions, when they come through, will be selected by me, and I will put them to Mark. I would now like to hand over to my colleague, Mark Fitzpatrick. Mark. Uh, thank you, Adam. So we've structured this uh, to talk about the what I think is the success of the Iran deal and the failure of efforts uh, to date to try to stem North Korea's nuclear and missile advances. But whether one thinks the Iran deal uh, really is uh, a success depends mostly on what one thought of the deal at the time it was negotiated a year ago. Many of those who opposed it then believe that it should have included non-nuclear provisions, such as restrictions on missile development and interventions in the region. Some critics wanted uh, no deal unless Iran fundamentally changed its behavior, its character. Iran hasn't changed its spots and its continuation of missile tests plus troublesome activities in the region and repression at home is prima facie proof to the critics that the deal is not working. But so far, uh, it's clear that the deal has succeeded in doing what it set out to do, effectively blocking all paths to a nuclear-armed Iran. The two quarterly reports by the International Atomic Energy Agency since the deal came into being in January confirm that Iran has met all of the conditions. The uranium stockpile that Iran had at the beginning of the negotiations has been reduced by 98% to less than 300 kilograms as attested to by the IAEA. The Iraq reactor, which I and others feared would be able to produce a weapons worth of plutonium, a weapons grade plutonium a year, uh, is no longer capable of producing plutonium. The number of Iran's operating centrifuges has been drastically cut. The deeply buried facility at Fordo no longer is for enrichment purposes. The intrusive inspection regime by the IAEA has been working. And on the potential downsides, uh, there's no further sign of what some had feared would be a proliferation cascade in the Middle East that Iran's um, uh, uh, legitimacy of its uh, small enrichment program would uh, trigger others, uh, particularly Saudi Arabia, to go down that route. A Brookings report in May indicated to the contrary that the Iran nuclear deal dramatically lessened the danger of a nuclear domino uh, effect in the Middle East. And there's no talk of war uh, today, which 
you know, a few years ago was deemed a 50-50 proposition. Israeli security officials hardly talk anymore about an Iranian nuclear threat. They're worried about other behavior by Iran, but the Iranian nuclear cloud over Israel has dissipated. And communications are working well between Iran and its uh, erstwhile uh, Western adversaries. They're still adversaries, but they're communicating both at the top among Secretary of State Kerry and Foreign Minister Zarif and down uh, through the working level. Uh, for example, there's a procurement working group uh, comprised of representatives from the eight parties that negotiated the deal, and it is meeting every three weeks in Vienna as planned. Issues that weren't anticipated during the negotiations are being worked out in a workmanlike way. There's good communication among all of the six parties, including between uh, uh, Western governments and Russia and China. But most importantly, there's extensive communication between Iran and the United States at various levels, both multilaterally and bilaterally. Now, there's, uh, nothing is, 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 is perfect in any world, and um, there have been some criticism leveled at the implementation to date. It's been uh, uh, noted that the reporting by the IAEA is much less detailed than was the case before the, de uh, before the uh, deal came into effect. That's because Iran is no longer charged as being in violation of UN Security Council resolutions. The IEA, uh, under the deal, is obliged not to report uh, most of the data that it obtains from its uh, inspections. But I've talked with government officials, and they feel pretty confident that they know what's going on in Iran. You know, they know more than what the IEA releases uh, to the public. As a researcher, I'd like to see the detail, but I'm confident that my government uh, at least sees it. My government, I'm an American, <laughs> my government believes that the man-made uranium particles that the IEA discovered at Parchin, the, uh, the military base at Parchin last year, that those particles were part of uh, a unreported Iranian uh, nuclear experiment uh, related to um, uh, military uh, use. And uh, Iran had been charged with having conducted such experiments. Uh, the IEA uh, finding two man-made uranium particles uh, seemed to clarify that. But the fact that the U.S. government believed uh, it was related to uh, nuclear-related experiments um, uh, somehow made news and uh, led some to call for further inspections at Parchin. But uh, uh, there's nothing more to be found at Parchin. It's been so thoroughly cleaned. Uh, and, uh, you know, the fact there are only two uh, uranium particles uh, is indication of how thoroughly it was cleaned. So demands to go back into Parchin for further inspection wouldn't do any good. I mean, they would, they would tend to exonerate Iran when nothing more was found. Making demands for new inspection should be limited to those occasions where there's good reason to believe that Iran has been doing something remiss and that inspections uh, would have a good chance of, of discovering that. Inspections should be information-based, uh, that is to say. Uh, another uh, issue that came up uh, very recently was uh, reporting by the German um, counterintelligence uh, agency of Iran's missile and nuclear-related procurement attempts, uh, which uh, the Germans uh, said was at a quantitatively high level in 2015, and that attempts to acquire missile technology showed an upward trend. In just one state, the counter-espionage officials had spotted 141 procurement attempts last year, twice as many as in 2014. Uh, this raised a lot of, uh, of, uh, of concern, and I was concerned myself. Uh, but it's important to note uh, two things. One, most of the procurement attempts were for missile-related uh, dual-use goods that also have civilian applications. And the key here is missile-related. Most of them were not nuclear-related, although some were. And the second key thing is that these procurement attempts were in 2015, before the 
uh, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action came into force on January uh, 16th. It's possible that Iran um, uh, went on a shopping spree before the deal uh, came into effect. Uh, it's also uh, quite possible that opponents of the deal in Iran uh, are carrying on activity that they know is problematic and they don't care. In fact, they would uh, like to shed a cloud on the deal. They, they don't like the deal. They don't like uh, President Rouhani's engagement with the West and they're doing what they can to uh, uh, create trouble for him. The question is whether there has been any um, procurement of nuclear-related items since the deal went into effect. According to the U.S. and German governments, the answer is they don't have any information about such uh, procurements. And one has to kind of parse these statements. Uh, no information about procurements. Well, what about procurement attempts? Did Iran attempt to get something, but it didn't succeed? And um, it, another way of parsing it is, uh, has Iran procured uh, things that clearly were in violation of the deal? Well, apparently not, but maybe less clearly. There was, maybe there was some am, uh, no, ambiguous uh, procurements. There's been some reporting about Iranian attempts to acquire uh, carbon fiber, which is uh, useful both in um, building centrifuges and also in making more lighter weight uh, missile bodies. Yeah, the information about these, this carbon fiber uh, procurement is uh, still murky and I think no more needs to, uh, to come to light. Uh, Iran claims that raw material, raw carbon fiber isn't covered uh, by the deal's uh, prohibitions. That's, that's laughable. I mean, clearly it's covered, but this is the kind of detail that is, is being discussed in, in the uh, uh, working level um, uh, uh, procurement uh, working group that I had mentioned earlier. There was uh, uh, some reporting in the Wall Street Journal that some uh, German intelligence officers had said that um, Iranian procurement attempts were continuing in uh, 2016. So I think there's there's more here uh, to, uh, to continue to look at. And it's the kind of, of issues that are, are certainly likely to continue to uh, crop up. Uh, nobody thought the Iran deal was going to work perfectly. Uh, the fact that it's worked uh, as good as it has is actually uh, surprising, uh, according to one uh, government official that I talked to. The biggest trouble is caused by Iran's continued missile development. A uh, report by uh, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said that Iran's ballistic missile launches are not consistent with the constructive spirit of the Iran deal. Whether or not it actually uh, constitutes a violation is up to the Security Council, he noted. And uh, he didn't note, but it's obvious that Germany and China are not going to agree to find Iran to be in violation of the Security Council resolution because of the missile testing, because the resolution uh, did not absolutely uh, prohibit the development. It called on Iran uh, not to continue uh, this development. Called on is not uh, usually deemed to be uh, the verb that uh, uh, creates a mandatory requirement. Ban Ki-moon did uh, call on Iran again to stop the tests and noted that they increased tensions in the Middle East. Iran's not listening. Um, Iran's uh, foreign policy, uh, foreign ministry spokesman said that Iran will strongly continue its missile program based on its own defense and national security calculations. So I think the missile development will continue to uh, uh, cause another uh, issue of concern uh, for the uh, uh, implementation of the Iran deal. But because the Iran deal was limited to nuclear and not uh, missile, uh, it won't be a, a violation uh, per se. Iranians have their own complaints about the implementation of the deal, uh, mainly um, the complaint that sanctions have not been lifted to the extent that they anticipated. Uh, Iran has not experienced the full economic benefits that it expected. It, it, it has gained access to about $50 billion in assets that were frozen overseas, although it hasn't actually got all that money in its hands. Um, it's, uh, it's doubled its oil exports to $2 billion a day. It's had uh, a lot of, uh, of foreign uh, companies uh, strike deals, but it hasn't had the uh, level of foreign investment 
that it had anticipated. One reason for this is that Iran's banking practices uh, remain um, non-transparent, uh, uh, prone to corruption, and not meeting the international norm. So banks are cautious about entering into risky business, especially given that uh, uh, in the past many of them have been massively fined uh, for doing business uh, with Iran that was not uh, fully transparent. Um, many are waiting for uh, the next U.S. Uh, presidential election, and they're waiting to make sure that um, other jurisdictions in the United States don't levy fines. And it's not just the U.S. Treasury, it's uh, the Manhattan District Attorney and other local governments in New York in particular, where um, most of the, the money from oil deals uh, uh, flows through for um, uh, for transaction purposes. Um, Iran has been making uh, some progress in cleaning up its act, uh, in making its banking transactions more uh, transparent, and that's been recognized by the Paris-based Financial Action Task Force, which has suspended mandatory countermeasures against Iran for one year. But it has kept Iran on its high list, uh, on its uh, high-risk blacklist. Iran and North Korea, the only two countries that are on the blackest of the uh, FATF uh, blacklists, uh, and all um, members of, of uh, FATF, FATF and all jurisdictions are advised uh, to apply enhanced due diligence to business relationships and transactions with Iran. Due diligence is costly for banks to apply. Uh, it's hard to uh, know the customer perfectly. If any of the customers are Iran Revolutionary Guard uh, Corps uh, affiliated, uh, that would run afoul of U.S. sanctions and uh, uh, be reason for um, fines uh, from the U.S. Uh, Treasury and other U.S. jurisdictions. So there's a lot of reason for caution in the bank international banking community. And it's going to take some time uh, for this caution uh, to dissipate and for Iran to uh, realize the full benefits that it had been expecting from sanctions lift. I was in an interview uh, with BBC Persia uh, last night and I, and I kept getting the repeated question about why can't the U.S. government uh, uh, lift these sanctions more thoroughly and I had to explain it's not just the U.S. government. Uh, it's commercial uh, decisions by banks themselves. The U.S. government has made clear um, that it has removed the sanctions or lifted the sanctions that it had promised to do under the uh, deal and it has advised banks that they are free to engage in um, legitimate uh, transactions but uh, the banks are just cautious uh, uh, to do it. One way that the United States government has uh, tried to facilitate trade was by uh, facilitating a um, massive uh, airplane deal by Boeing, a $25 billion deal involving the sale of 80 passenger planes and the leasing of 29 others. Um, there have been many critics of that deal. Uh, last uh, week, the U.S. House of Representatives passed legislation to block the Boeing sale uh, on grounds that uh, these planes um, might be used to ferry arms to the um, Hezbollah uh, group in Lebanon and to uh, Syria's uh, Assad uh, regime, which it has, uh, which Iran Air and its subsidiary uh, have done in the past. Um, the subsidiary has also uh, apparently been uh, involved in transactions uh, with North Korea. So there's good reason to be worried about how uh, Iran would use these planes. The U.S. government says it has the tools to ensure that any planes uh, won't be diverted uh, for unapproved purposes. The House of Representatives uh, didn't quite agree and wanted to, uh, to block uh, the sale altogether. It's not going to become law. Um, first of all, the Senate did not approve similar legislation, and you need both houses to approve legislation. And even if the Senate had approved it, uh, Obama uh, would have veto it, vetoed it because it would have violated a provision of the Iran deal that commits the United States to allow for the sale of commercial passenger aircraft and related parts and services for exclusively uh, civil aviation and use. Now, if Iran were to use uh, any of these aircraft for um, transferring arms to Hezbollah or uh, Syria, it would be a clear violation and there would be clearly uh, sanctions levied. Uh, just as there will be sanctions levied 
um, against uh, any further missile uh, development that in involves um, uh, testing of longer range systems. The, um, but the, uh, these uh, additional sanctions will uh, probably be uh, entity uh, specific. Uh, additional Iranian entities and individuals will be added to the blacklist. I don't uh, anticipate that whole sectors of the Iranian economy would be um, uh, sanctioned as uh, some in Congress have demanded. Uh, it's interesting that uh, Iran has tried to um, uh, claim, Iran has claimed that any uh, new sanctions uh, at any level, uh, said uh, Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei, uh, on any excuse would be considered a breach of the agreement and that Iran would restart its nuclear program. Well, that's clearly a bluff. You know, at any level. I mean, if Iran uh, violates um, uh, international norms, um, uh, be they on missile testing or um, using its, the aircraft uh, to ferry um, arms, uh, they'll be sanctioned. And the United States and, and its um, partner uh, governments can't uh, uh, fall for Iran's bluff. But if the United States Congress um, were to re uh, install the sanctions that were lifted under the deal uh, in violation of the provision that said that the sanctions uh, lifted would not be reimposed, well, Iran would uh, have just cause. So it's important um, that, uh, that any uh, imposition of sanctions be, be clearly uh, Iran's fault and not, uh, not something that would give it cause uh, to say that the West has violated the deal. There's other uh, problems, of course, between Iran and, uh, and its neighbors and the West. Uh, there was a hope that this deal would uh, create a transformational relationship between Iran and the West, but it was, it was a hope, and it wasn't, uh, the deal was not predicated on that hope of becoming reality. Uh, there was a hope that um, uh, President Rouhani would um, uh, be strengthened uh, that his inclinations uh, for domestic reforms to make Iran a less repressive state uh, would be strengthened. But there was also a realization that in the near term that wasn't likely to happen because uh, the opponents internally in Iran of the deal, the opponents of Rouhani, would be um, inclined to um, show that they hadn't bowed to uh, the West, they hadn't caved, and, uh, and that they would... Uh, get even stronger in their domestic uh, repression. I mean, the jailing of a, of a, of a dual citizen American um, and uh, other Western nationals, and plus the behavior in the region. The um, Iranian uh, continued to support for uh, Syria's regime, its continued support uh, to Hezbollah, its uh, intervention in Yemen, all of this uh, causes concern. But uh, one can find some small ways that uh, that um, the deal has uh, uh, created uh, room for Iran to engage um, constructively with the West. Uh, Secretary of State John Kerry said last, might, last uh, month that Iran's presence in Iraq has been helpful to uh, attempts to beat back the threat of ISIS, uh, Daesh, uh, a common enemy uh, to both um, Iran uh, and Western countries uh, and Russia. Um, European Union Foreign Policy Chief uh, Federica Mogherini uh, has said that the deal paved the way for renewed dialogue on Syria. Um, you know, peace talks aren't going well, but Iran is now part of the, uh, the discussions, part of the, the talks. It's no longer an outside player. And it's, peace is not going to come to Syria without the participation of a major player uh, like Iran. There have been some other small um, hints of, of potential good news. I wouldn't want to make uh, too much of this. There was a story uh, that cyber attacks uh, from Iran against uh, American and Israeli uh, institutions have decreased uh, since the time of the deal. I don't know, the causality of that is hard to prove, and uh, maybe Iranian um, hackers are just biding their time. But I think in general, just to sum up on Iran, one can say that, yes, this deal is succeeding. Uh, there are um, reasons to be worried, but um, 
Iran hasn't violated the deal, the West hasn't violated the deal, uh, the region is, uh, is better off uh, so far because of the deal. And that's not the case in North Korea, where things have gone from bad to worse. Um, North Korea's um, nuclear and missile program, just in the past uh, six months, has um, just been one thing after another. Uh, they tested a nuclear device. They launched a satellite using ballistic missile technology. They tested a new solid-fueled rocket motor. They displayed a miniaturized uh, nuclear warhead and a road mobile intercontinental ballistic missile. They conducted a simulated test of a, of a heat shield for a missile nose cone in, um, in atmospheric reentry. They staged the second uh, and uh, third tests of a, a submarine-launched ballistic missile. They tested six times the intermediate-range uh, road mobile Musudan, and finally, finally in the last two tests, uh, they succeeded. It may not be uh, long before North Korea uh, successfully tests an ICBM, which uses two Musudan engines in its uh, first stage. Um, you know, for each of these uh, developments, one can um, say, well, it wasn't as bad as it, it could be. I mean, for example, uh, the Musudan uh, lofted uh, trajectory uh, was the equivalent of a horizontal range of about 3,150 kilometers, according to IISS uh, consulting fellow Michael Elliman. That's about 300 kilometers short of Guam. And uh, North Korea's whole purpose in developing this um, intermediate range um, system was to be able to hit American territory, uh, Guam. Well, it can't yet, but it's only a matter of time. North Korea continues to make rapid strides. So the question is, can what has worked for Iran to date work for North Korea? And I'm not too uh, optimistic about this, but it's important to note that the Iran deal happened because there were leaders on both sides ready uh, to accept uh, a compromise. And the compromises um, involved both uh, incentives and disincentives. And for North Korea, I don't know that either of those conditions uh, applies, whether there are pragmatic leaders um, uh, in both sides. Certainly, um, whether there's a pragmatic leader in North Korea is doubtful. Everything Kim Jong-un has uh, done to date suggests uh, uh, an uh, undiminished determination to acquire uh, nuclear armed ballistic missiles that can hit not just its neighbors, uh, but the United States. But nobody really knows because nobody's met Kim Jong-un except for a crazy U.S. basketball player, Dennis Rodman. Uh, it's not because um, uh, America and other governments haven't tried to, um, to communicate, uh, but they haven't succeeded. And they probably haven't tried at the same level of determination that was the case in Iran, where uh, President Obama himself was very actively involved in the, um, in the run-up to the negotiations and in the negotiations. Uh, in the next uh, U.S. presidency, uh, the president's uh, team has to focus on this uh, North Korean threat, whether they seek to uh, find a way to communicate with uh, Kim Jong-un, I don't know, but I think they, they really need to try. And they need to be willing to apply both incentives and disincentives. The disincentives part of it uh, is pretty clearly in place. The UN Security Council uh, resolution earlier in the year um, uh, brought the sanctions on North Korea to the level that had been applied uh, to Iran. It blacklisted uh, North Korean vessels, uh, which now have um, pretty much been restricted uh, to North Korean waters. And um, member states of the UN have um, added to those uh, to the Security Council resolution. Um, this um, includes uh, South Korea, which has been going around the world uh, uh, one by one, uh, reducing North Korea's markets uh, in Africa, uh, persuading uh, Uganda and Ethiopia and Namibia to cut ties uh, with North Korea to reduce uh, the ways in which North Korea has acquired hard currency through sales of military items. And the United States uh, uh, applied um, 
a very uh, strict uh, measure, making the uh, North Korea a primary money laundering concern. This means that any uh, bank that seeks to do uh, financial transactions with North Korea would be denied access to the U.S. Um, financial system. So major um, banks and companies uh, won't be dealing with North Korea. Uh, whether North Korea uh, will be uh, permanently hampered by these restrictions is uh, questionable. They've, they've learned to uh, find ways around sanctions in the past. They mostly use um, hard currency uh, suitcases of cash for their transactions, so they don't uh, use uh, international banking much. But these, uh, these, these dollars that they carry around still have to be um, uh, transferred uh, to Korean uh, currency. So there are ways to try to get at them. It's just that sanctions alone probably are not going to persuade North Korea. Just as in the Iran case, um, the United States and its partners had to accept some, some difficult compromises to um, uh, go away from the uh, what had been the clear um, policy of no enrichment to allowing some limited enrichment. And the question if, uh, uh, in the future, if uh, negotiations, um, engagement with uh, North Korea were to show any promises, what might be the equivalent of the limited uh, enrichment uh, uh, compromise that was made for Iran? Uh, you know, I hesitate to, uh, to, to suggest much because uh, North Korea is such a difficult country. But I think something might be found in North Korea's uh, insistence on having uh, negotiations on a peace treaty to end the Korean War. I mean, after uh, 60 years, uh, it really is time to, uh, to put a, a full end to the Korean War. And a peace treaty does not have to mean an end to the U.S.-South Korean alliance. It doesn't have to mean an end to the U.S. Uh, force presence in South Korea. Um, so there, there is something, I think, that could be done uh, by means of negotiating a peace treaty that was tied to uh, denuclearization. Hints have been made by the U.S. government about this, but uh, so far the U.S. government has insisted on prior steps, preconditions by North Korea to show its um, uh, sincerity about denuclearization. Of course, North Korea doesn't agree to any denuclearization at all. So the two sides uh, just uh, remain uh, full apart. Uh, uh, but I'll just conclude this, uh, this uh, webinar um, initial presentation by saying that um, Iran, the Iran case looked pretty hopeless for most of the 20 years that I was engaged in, in um, assessing Iran. And as hopeless as the North Korean case now seems, I don't think we've exhausted, I don't think governments have exhausted all the possibilities to try to, uh, to uh, stem uh, North Korea's uh, provocative nuclear and missile developments. Great. Thank you very much indeed uh, for that, Mark. Uh, we now move into the questions uh, section of, of the webinar. We have a number of them already coming in. Uh, just a reminder that you can uh, ask your question via the chat function, and um, we'll do our best to get in as many as possible. The, uh, the first question comes from Stefan Bush from AstraZeneca, who asks you to talk a little bit about the uh, contrasting positions of the, the, the candidates in the U.S. presidential election. Uh, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton about their attitudes towards uh, Iran in particular and how, 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 um, whether there are any differences and what they might be? Well, there clearly are differences uh, in that uh, Hillary Clinton is a supporter of the Iran deal and can be um, assumed uh, to uh, want to continue uh, faithful implementation of the deal, albeit with uh, uh, probably a um, a bit more uh, hard-nosed attitude uh, toward Iran's missile development. I, I could anticipate her more quickly um, designating uh, Iranian um, entities involved in the missile development, although most of them that have been involved have already been designated. So it's not that easy just to add designations. You actually have to have some evidence uh, of involvement. Uh, but I think she'll be a little bit uh, harder-nosed about that uh, while still uh, implementing faithfully the deal. Trump's position, um, like anything else, is, uh, is up in the air. Uh, who knows what he would do? He initially uh, talked uh, about ripping up the deal. He's called it the worst deal ever. More recently, he has said that he would renegotiate the deal. So that's a difference in opinion. 
uh, in, in, uh, in uh, stated um, uh, policy. Uh, but uh, in effect, uh, renegotiating the deal would mean um, ending it because uh, there are no provisions for renegotiating it. And the United States unilaterally can't just renegotiate it. It's a deal involving eight parties, none of the others of which uh, have any interest in renegotiating it unless uh, Iran were to uh, uh, violate uh, the deal, in which case it would be, um, they'd be found in violation and there would be a lot of ensuing to and fro. But, uh, but Trump uh, seems to evolve uh, from day to day. It, uh, it, you know, it may depend on who he appoints uh, as his key um, cabinet um, uh, secretaries. And his inclination to um, not be involved in foreign entanglements uh, suggests to me that uh, he could have a bit of a hands-off attitude, plus his, his attitude toward Russia of, uh, of seeking ways to um, work with, um, with Putin suggests also that uh, his uh, uh, presidency would, would not automatically mean an end to the Iran deal. Uh, we have a question related to this uh, from Saeed Bazin, formerly of the BBC Monitoring Service, who asks whether you are aware of um, any efforts by those in America in particular who were resistant to the deal, um, who may be represented in Congress or elsewhere, to understate, uh, undertake steps um, to slow down the process of normalization of relations with Iran? I'm sure that uh, those who were opposed to the deal would um, uh, be opposed to steps uh, toward normalization. But frankly, there are no steps uh, toward normalization. There's nothing to slow down, really. Um, there uh, is communication. And that communication is, uh, is very significant. Um, when uh, untoward developments occur, like the um, inadvertent um, uh, entry into Iranian waters of two American uh, naval vessels and the seizure by Iran, um, uh, you know, that was nego their, their release was negotiated uh, very quickly. That's an example, not of normalization, but of how good communications can overcome uh, difficulties. Uh, there are uh, communications um, regarding um, Iraq, uh, the fight in Iraq against Daesh, but there's a, 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 a very strong reluctance in Iran to engage with the United States on anything other than the nuclear deal. It's, um, uh, it's a, a very uh, intense uh, political struggle in Iran, and it's uh, getting worse and worse up, uh, until uh, the time of Iran's next presidential election next June. So there are no um, uh, ongoing talks that I'm aware of on regional issues between the United States and Iran, no um, uh, movement toward normalization. If there were uh, to be any moves, I, I assume that the opponents of the deal in the U.S. Congress would uh, be um, very wary of that. Whether they would have the votes to um, shoot it down is another matter, and uh, as we could see by the efforts to uh, stop the Boeing deal, opponents don't have the votes uh, to stop it. So uh, if, uh, if Iran was able to engage, if Iran was able to overcome its own domestic opposition to um, further uh, engagement on other issues besides nuclear, um, I, I know that the Obama administration would like to do so, and I anticipate that, the, uh, that a Hillary Clinton administration would like to do so too and that um, it couldn't be stopped um, by, the, um, by the Congress as uh, currently made up, and you know, who knows what the next Congress will look like, but um, presumably uh, a Hillary Clinton um, victory would mean a, a Congress that had a, uh, at least a, a larger uh, percentage of uh, supporters of the Democratic Party. Uh, Japan traditionally has had a, a strong economic engagement with Iran, and we have a question from Yogendra Kumar, a retired diplomat from uh, an unspecified country, but he asks whether uh, you think the reticence shown by U.S. banks in terms of engaging Iran is, is, is also being seen in the case of Japan or, or Japanese financial institutions uh, doing more to rush into that uh, field of opportunity. Well, I think that, um, first, first of all, every um, 
Western bank is uh, showing reluctance. And U.S. banks uh, can't engage with Iran anyway. Uh, they're prohibited. U.S. banks can't do uh, direct deals with Iran because of the remaining prohibitions on, um, on, on trade between the United States and Iran. So uh, the important point is the reluctance of, of any international banks that themselves deal with the U.S. financial system are reluctant uh, to engage uh, with Iran and um, put themselves uh, at risk of, of any um, existing U.S. Uh, sanctions, including the one that prohibits any engage any any deals with with some member of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, um, members of which um, are said to um, uh, control up to 40% of the Iranian economy. Plus, um, the international banks are are worried about any new. Uh, restrictions that might be imposed by, say, a Trump administration or uh, by local jurisdictions in the United States. So J Japanese banks are among those that are reluctant. Uh, there's a question from um, Thanos Dokos uh, from Iliadep in, in Athens who really asks you to comment on uh, the degree of ballistic missile development by Iran and the extent to which that justifies or does not justify uh, NATO's um, moves to deploy anti-missile capabilities? You know, Iran's um, ballistic missile development um, is um, been on a, a, a pace that is not necessarily greater than it was before the Iran deal, but it certainly hasn't slackened. And current efforts by Iran's missile development program are aimed at in proving the accuracy of the missiles, not at extending the range. Iran's uh, intermediate range um, ballistic missiles can uh, hit about 2,600 um, kilometers. That brings them, um, uh, brings Greece, uh, Turkey, and other uh, parts of Southeast um, Europe in the range of, uh, of Iran's missiles. But there's no um, uh, reason to um, be um, optimistic that Iran would not seek to develop long-range missiles, given particularly the evidence of ongoing um, missile cooperation with North Korea. North Korea uh, uh, clearly is developing longer-range systems and seeks an intercontinental ballistic missile. There was a, uh, a U.S. Treasury report uh, last year when they designated um, some Iranian officials as having violated uh, U.S. Uh, sanctions that uh, Iran and North Korean uh, missile um, uh, uh, personnel uh, were jointly developing an 80-ton uh, thrust motor. That's, that's a pretty large uh, motor for a long-range system. So if you are concerned about potential Iranian longer range systems, and there's no reason not to uh, think that this could happen, uh, there is a reason to continue um, ballistic missile defense in Eastern Europe. Questions might be raised about the pace and nature of the anti-ballistic missile systems, but you always have to anticipate uh, developments by a potential adversary, and it takes time to develop countermeasures, and that's why the um, ballistic missile systems in Eastern Europe aren't being withdrawn. Uh, returning to the question again of, of banks and Iran, um, Richard Bridge of BP asks you whether there's anything more that the US government can, can do to reassure banks by the provision of things like letters of comfort uh, or the like. Yeah, Richard, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I don't see the US government providing uh, such a written uh, assurance, and I'm not sure that it would have much validity uh, in any case. Um, but uh, Press, uh, Secretary Kerry and uh, U.S. Treasury officials have gone around the world uh, trying to re give reassurances that uh, illicit trade uh, will not be uh, penalized. But they can't guarantee that local governments, particularly in New York, uh, wouldn't um, uh, seek to penalize and the, the way the U.S. system works, uh, you know, the federal government just can't do that. So I think the, it might be a question though whether European governments themselves would um, seek to indemnify 
their banks and businesses against any uh, potential future um, uh, 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 sanctions uh, uh, related uh, fines. That would be within the um, the right of uh, of nation states to do. I don't know that uh, anyone is uh, actually thinking about that though. Um, we'll have uh, some questions now on, on North Korea. Um, I wonder, Mark, whether you feel that the, the sort of referent point for the North Koreans is not so much what is going on with the implementation of the Iran Accord, but uh, the experience they went through uh, with their agreed framework in 1994, which was also based on a mixture of incentives and, and, and penalties, um, and which ultimately uh, faltered in light of North Korea's violation of the nuclear restrictions that it had meant to be observing. But throughout that whole process, North Korea had also complained that the things that it had been promised in terms of the provision of light water reactors and a number of other things had never satisfactorily been met. So do you think um, that experience generally um, ensures that North Korea is not really predisposed, predisposed to, to consider a kind of a, an Iranian-style approach, even if that, uh, that could be assembled? Yeah, I think the way you frame the question, Adam, uh, is uh, is entirely uh, accurate. That uh, North Korea's referent point is not um, how other uh, states have engaged in uh, negotiations, but um, how uh, the North Korean state itself uh, has experienced um, negotiations and interactions uh, with um, uh, what it considers uh, to be. Um, a, uh, a severe uh, nuclear threat imposed by the United States and its uh, allies. You know, many times uh, the United States and uh, the government and other governments and, um, and people like myself have, have tried to persuade North Korea to look at the advantages uh, that have been um, accrued to uh, states that engage effectively in negotiations with the United S uh, States uh, to um, to give up uh, weapons of mass destruction programs. Now, um, <laughs> the uh, case of, uh, of Libya used to be one such example that was proffered, but when uh, Gaddafi was uh, uh, summarily uh, dragged from a manhole and, uh, uh, and murdered, uh, executed, I should say, uh, that didn't uh, um, give that uh, Libya case much uh, uh, credence. And North Korea drew the obvious uh, conclusion that uh, it's better not to uh, make such deals to give up um, one's um, nuclear programs. The Iran case is a much stronger case, though, um, especially if uh, Iran can be seen to be economically prospering and to be improving its international position, escaping isolation and, uh, and the like. But I can't say that I've, uh, I've seen any evidence that North Korea is paying attention to that. Uh, they pay attention to ways in which they think the United States is, in, is a continuing so-called hostile policy. The, uh, the 1994 agreed framework uh, was a pretty good uh, agreement um, in terms of, uh, of Western interest. It, it uh, stopped North Korea's plutonium program, retarded it, uh, North Korea did not go on to build the large reactors that it had been under, that were under construction that could have uh, produced uh, 250, uh, I'm sorry, produced uh, several dozen uh, bombs worth of plutonium a year. But uh, North Korea uh, is now resuming other uh, uh, nuclear related uh, nuclear work that uh, will give it an increased uh, nuclear weapons uh, development uh, uh, possibility. One of the previous um, uh, elements of the uh, North Korean interactions uh, with the West uh, was um, in uh, 2005 when uh, the United States designated the North Korean, um, well, designated the a bank in Macau, uh, Banco Delta, a Asia, Banco Delta, Banco Asia, Banco Asia Delta, as a, a money uh, laundering concern and uh, and 36 million dollars of uh, or so of, Iran, of North Korean um, a, uh, assets uh, were frozen. Um, that uh, had a big impact on North Korea and uh, is presumably why the United States has now designated all of uh, North Korea as a money laundering concern. But North Korea learned from that uh, uh, example and that's why they, they now conduct most of their transactions uh, with uh, cash.
Uh, two prior questioners, Richard Bridge and Stefan Bush, have come back with like, the identical question about whether China's role could be uh, strengthened to uh, deal with the North Korean situation. It's always um, in any um, U.S. government or, or other Western government um, uh, rendition of, uh, of the ways uh, to to try to rein in uh, North Korea. The role of China is always uh, very uh, top of the uh, of the list. Uh, you know, if only uh, China could employ its uh, leverage, uh, runs the uh, uh, thinking uh, that North Korea could really um, uh, be uh, faced uh, with uh, with severe uh, difficulty that would uh, then cause it to reassess uh, its uh, nuclear weapons program. China is not. Uh, going to bring the pressure on North Korea that would have that impact. Uh, whether China actually has the leverage that is assumed is one question, and there's different ways to assess that. Certainly they have more leverage than they have been willing to employ, but uh, China simply is not going to be willing to employ leverage that uh, could cause pressure on North Korea to the extent that would um, possibly uh, create uh, internal turmoil in North Korea that would then uh, put pressure on China's own borders, cause a refugee flow, uh, and the like. That's you know, keeping China's border secure, its uh, border populations um, 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 free from turmoil is uh, China's number one priority. And uh, the priority of keeping uh, the Korean Peninsula nuclear weapons free um, is obviously a, a lesser priority. But that doesn't mean that uh, China can't be persuaded to do more. It, uh, it was persuaded to go along with the most recent uh, Security Council resolution, um, which uh, uh, prohibited um, a lot of activity with North Korea. There are loopholes in that legislation, loopholes. For example, um, uh, the, legis uh, the Security Council sanctions uh, prohibited um, imports of North Korean uh, coal and, uh, and iron, except um, uh, in cases where it was for um, non-military uh, civilian uses or, or something to that effect, and uh, that's a huge loophole. The Security Council um, should be persuaded, China should be persuaded to close that loophole, and I think China uh, uh, could be uh, after the next uh, North Korean provocation. That will put more pressure on North Korea, but I just don't think uh, we should think that pressure by China is the salvation and the solution to the North Korea problem. Uh, it's going to have to be um, uh, balanced uh, with some incentives. And, and China itself said that it went along with Security Council resolution um, only uh, because it was um, a, a precursor to engagement. It, it, it's, it, it requires um, uh, engagement in order to apply further pressure on North Korea. A final, uh, broader question, which is posed by Paulo Cesar Leal, who is a uh, colonel in the uh, Brazilian army, about what you consider to be uh, the broad prospects for nuclear proliferation trends going forward. Uh, at the start of your presentation, you mentioned the fact that the um, cascade, the nuclear cascade in the Middle East, that some had cited as uh, an imminent prospect, has not yet materialized. Um, you are at the same time an author of a recent ISS Delphi book looking at the onward proliferation concerns in um, Taiwan, in South Korea, uh, and in, in Japan, which largely um, would be generated by uh, concerns about the North Korean uh, threat. Can you just um, go into some detail about both of those cases? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question to, uh, to end this uh, talk on, to look more broadly. Uh, one of the reasons I wrote the book about uh, the potential for nuclear proliferation cascade in Northeast Asia was because uh, so much concern has been raised about whether the Iran program will provoke uh, uh, a nuclear cascade in the Middle East. The North uh, East Asia uh, uh, case uh, is an example of how that hasn't happened. Uh, Japan, for example, has faced a succession of uh, nuclear armed uh, adversarial neighbors, first the Soviet Union, uh, then China, uh, now North Korea. Each time a case could have been made that that uh, should have prompted uh, Japan to go nuclear itself. Uh, 
to have a deterrent uh, uh, to balance the threat. And each time, Japan didn't. The underlying um, so-called nuclear allergy in Japan has remained strong, popular opposition to nuclear weapons, and most importantly, the fact that Iran was able to rely upon the uh, security assurances provided by the U.S. extended deterrence. It was a much uh, uh, cheaper, uh, less problematic way for Japan to uh, um, uh, protect itself in concert with the United States. The same has held true for South Korea, although in the 1970s South Korea twice uh, pursued nuclear weapons when it doubted America's commitment, when Jimmy Carter uh, talked about withdrawing uh, U.S. troops from South Korea. Uh, a, uh, a policy he reversed uh, uh, upon uh, advice from uh, the people he appointed to his, his cabinet. But it did cause South Korea to, uh, to feel it couldn't rely on the United States. And Taiwan at the same time, under an authoritarian government, uh, similarly uh, worried that it couldn't rely on the United States and pursued nuclear weapons. Um, the United States uh, learned about it through very good intelligence. Um, it took a long time to stop it, stopped it twice. Uh, Taiwan continued over the course of 20 years, but finally Taiwan, uh, under a democratic um, uh, government, um, uh, departed from the nuclear weapons route. And the question is whether any of these governments might go down that route again. Uh, I assessed in my book that, um, that they would not because they could continue to rely upon the United States security commitment, although in the case of Taiwan it's not a uh, uh, a treaty-based commitment, it's, it's an implied commitment. And uh, I pointed out as well that developing nuclear weapons uh, can't be done overnight, even in the case of, North, of Japan, which is closest uh, to the market, would take um, probably a minimum of a year and probably more. And during that time, um, the country that went down that route would be very vulnerable to its adversaries and uh, could not re rely upon the continued support of the United States, which has been a strong proponent of, of non-proliferation and wouldn't uh, be at all happy uh, with efforts to seek nuclear weapons and might uh, uh, withdraw its uh, uh, security uh, assurance, as um, was the case in the 1970s when Henry Kissinger told Park Chung-hee in South Korea, uh, if you don't give up uh, uh, nuclear weapons pursuit, um, you can give up uh, the U.S. Uh, security. Uh, alliance and Park Chung-hee uh, chose the appropriate uh, response. So I don't uh, see um, South, uh, North countries in Northeast Asia. They haven't gone down um, uh, the path. Uh, the, the concern, though, is that in, in South Korea in particular, popular attitudes are weak in terms of nonproliferation norms. In successive uh, polling, uh, percentages as high as two-thirds maybe now it's uh, more down to 55% of the South Korean population say, yes, they should have nuclear weapons. And this uh, policy is advised by senior politicians of the ruling party, particularly um, before a parliamentary election. They were talking about that less uh, today. So there, uh, there is reason to be concerned uh, about popular attitudes in South Korea. And then when Donald Trump himself uh, uh, said uh, earlier this year that um, maybe uh, Japan and South Korea and Saudi Arabia should have their own nuclear weapons to protect themselves. That really undermined the credibility of U.S. deterrence. Trump subsequently uh, changed his position, said he only said that, well, one of his um, uh, uh, advisors said he only said that for um, negotiation leverage purposes to get the countries to, to pay more for the U.S. troop presence. And Trump himself denied that he had ever said that, uh, that he encouraged those states to go nuclear, although clearly he had. Um, you know, you, you can't be entirely sure um, what would transpire uh, in a Trump uh, administration. And in the case of, um, of Saudi Arabia, when Iran was um, getting closer and closer to being able to have a nuclear weapons capability in a short period of time, there was more and more reason to be concerned that the Saudis would seek a nuclear weapons option of their own. They were talking openly about that. Um, now that the Iran deal has um, made it practically impossible for Iran to, uh, to do, um, get nuclear weapons without being uh, spotted early on and, uh, and prevented, um, 
Saudi Arabia is not going to go down that route. Um, but uh, it, it remains possible. I wouldn't put it out of, uh, out of uh, concern. So um, you know, intelligence agencies will uh, remain uh, concerned about any signs of uh, such a development. Analysts like myself have to remain concerned. Fortunately, there aren't too many uh, cases uh, recently of countries that have uh, broken NPT commitments. Uh, North Korea is the only one. And every country uh, is either inside the NPT or four of them are on the outside and already have nuclear weapons. So where would be the next case? Uh, you know, I've talked about some of the potential countries and um, they aren't doing it. Um, I think there's reason to, uh, to believe that they won't, but still um, reason to keep our eyes open. Uh, Mark, thank you very much indeed for a very wide-ranging, uh, detailed uh, tutorial, really, in the last uh, one hour or so. Uh, we'll now bring it to a close. We will make sure that a recording of the webinar is going to be on our website as well as available on our YouTube channel. I'd like to thank everyone who joined uh, this call and uh, participated in it. And we look forward to uh, advising you of further editions of the ISS webinar series. Thank you very much and goodbye.